Section 12 of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 9 Louis and Spain. The Dutch Republic, 1660 to 1662. The death of Mazarin in March of 1661 found Europe in a state of almost absolute repose the peace of westphalia had reformed the constitution of the german empire the treaty of the pyrenees had confirmed a truce in the long warfare of france and spain while the relative positions of sweden denmark and poland had been settled by the treaties of copenhagen and oliva in sixteen sixty one the independence of the dutch republic had been recognized the monarchy was permanently re-established in england Number one, personality of Louis the Fourteenth. Already, however, the agencies which were to put an end to this short breathing space were at work. Of these, none was more potent than the ambition and the power of Louis the Fourteenth. That monarch was the central figure of Europe, the despotic sovereign of a united country, and the master of a superb army mazarin and the fronde had schooled him well to repress his passions to keep down the princes of the blood to be distant with his courtiers to be secret in his business to cultivate his natural talents for dissimulation to work hard these were to be the principles which should make him a great king above all the cardinal had urged him with his dying breath to have no prime minister he was to succeed to a double power and prestige, those of the monarchy and those of the prime ministership. He took possession of both parts of his inheritance at once. On the day after Mazarin's death, he announced to the council his intention of taking the government solely upon himself. His ministers, his gens d'affaires, he called them, were henceforward to look to him for instructions his mother and the courtiers laughed at what they imagined was but a passing whim but the whim lasted more than fifty years during all that time no man in his kingdom worked harder than he no dispatch was signed no agreement sealed no money paid without his knowledge his energy and diligence were no more remarkable than his ability devoid of political morality he looked upon the state of Europe with an eye piercing and cynical, while the dispatches written by himself to his ambassadors in all the European courts are models of clearness of expression and correctness of insight. Number two, Louis claims, one, the whole Spanish succession, two, the immediate possession of the Spanish Netherlands it was in his efforts to establish his claim upon the succession to the spanish monarchy that these qualities were first exercised should philip the fourth and his only son die as seemed probable without the birth of any other male heir in the meantime louis was determined to uphold the right of his wife that right as has been seen was rejected by the spaniards on the ground that both she and louis had signed a renunciation louis replied in the first place that the spaniards had themselves rendered that renunciation invalid by the non-payment of the dowry and secondly that no renunciation could be upheld which was contrary to a fundamental law of the spanish monarchy in june sixteen sixty one the hereditary prince was on his deathbed another child was about to be born to philip the fourth and his second wife should this be a son the question of renunciation would of course not be raised and the french ambassador was ordered in that case merely to press for the payment of the dowry on november first the prince died but a week later another boy the future charles the second was born and louis's path to the succession to the whole spanish monarchy was thus completely barred for the time his claim too had been contested from another side the second daughter of philip the third unlike louis's mother the elder daughter had signed no renunciation of her rights she had married the late emperor ferdinand and was the mother of the present emperor leopold who therefore claimed in her right to this louis again had a double answer 
first the old one of the inherent invalidity of all these renunciations secondly that in any case it would be neither his mother nor the emperor's but the present unmarried infanta who if she married would transmit her right to her husband and descendants and therefore unless she married the emperor neither he nor his children could claim in any case this contention of the emperor like that of louis himself fell of course into abeyance at the birth of the new prince but though the prospect of grasping the whole spanish monarchy had thus for the time faded away the ingenuity of louis's advisers had suggested another plan by which he might compass that portion of it most immediately important to him by a local custom of brabant referring solely to private property and in force in some only of the provinces of the low countries it was established that if a man married twice the succession went to the children of the first marriage to the exclusion of those of the second this local custom the use devolutionis as it was called louis audaciously determined to invoke in order to form a claim at philip the fourth's death to the whole of the low countries that king had married twice and louis had married the only daughter of the first marriage the death of the hereditary prince her brother left her therefore if the local and private custom was to be held with regard to the succession a contention ridiculed by the spaniards the heiress to the low countries to the entire exclusion of the children of philip's second marriage the present infanta and the boy just born louis had meanwhile been endeavouring to compass his object by diplomacy hopeless of conquering portugal by force spain aware of the help which louis was unavowedly sending to it though ignorant of his connection with charles the second of england now by promises of eventual consent to the nullity of the renunciation and by urging the argument that england would if not checked grow too powerful at sea endeavoured to draw the french monarchy into a coalition against that country louis's answer was short and decisive ridiculing the idea of england growing too powerful he declared that to justify him in the eyes of europe for such a step he must have striking advantages offered him his terms were number one a secret revocation of the renunciation number two the immediate possession of franche comte luxembourg Aino, and cambrai and failing the revocation the towns of air and saint omer as well on these conditions alone would he consent to break with the king of england but spain was not yet brought low enough to listen to such humiliating terms and though louis changed his tone to one of menace he found himself unable to move the court of madrid from its attitude of passive resistance to all his claims in october sixteen sixty two the negotiations were finally broken off louis had meanwhile been looking elsewhere for means of accomplishing his ends number three the dutch republic in striking contrast to the success of the monarchical principle in france and england was the development of the power of the dutch republic by the side of the absolute monarchy and the caste feeling of france and the threefold system of king established church and parliament in england was reigning a form of government in which there was neither arbitrary power aristocratic privilege nor ecclesiastical supremacy it consisted of a league of seven provinces each province preserving perfect independence as regarded its internal affairs but contributing its share to mutual defence the province in its turn was a federation of towns each of which bore to its province the same relation as that of the province to the whole federated body the town was thus the unit of national life the basis of the constitution its government was in the hands of a town council of varying number a merchant oligarchy for the most part self-elected who delegated their executive power and financial administration to a regent and it possessed complete autonomy in its own concerns it sent deputies to the provincial estates which regulated the entire internal affairs of that province administrative financial military and judicial 
similarly each province sent deputies to the states-general who assisted by a council of state composed of twelve members selected from the different provinces voted upon the imperial questions of the republic peace war and measures for defence fixed the contingent of each province to the army and fleet and had the right of concluding alliances and of nominating the commanders-in-chief both by land and sea each province however was bound to obey the states-general only if its own deputies agreed in the decision and similarly each town was bound to obey the decision of the provincial council only if its deputies had concurred admirably adapted for the encouragement of local ambition and for the training of a large proportion of the citizens in the public service such a constitution was evidently unsuitable for crises when a common danger demanded immediate action on the part of the republic as a whole the need of a central authority overriding the individual interests or prejudices of each province or town was then keenly felt the history of the republic therefore shows a tendency to fall back in times of national peril upon the principle of a limited monarchy and when that danger is over to revert to the original constitution the struggle by which its independence was secured had been carried out under the house of orange to this family it had for a time given the supreme military and civil authority in the person of the first stadtholder william of orange and this authority legally elective had gradually become hereditary four members of the orange house successively ruled over the seven provinces and it was not until sixteen fifty one that the attempt of william the second the husband of mary daughter of charles i to acquire absolute sovereignty by a coup d'etat led to the abolition of the stadtholdership the autonomy of each town and province was then re-established and to render impossible the recurrence of an attempt at absolutism the military command was so divided that for purposes of foreign war the army was well-nigh useless the republic had shaken off the domination of a person it now fell under the domination of a single province holland was overwhelmingly preponderant in the federation she possessed the richest most populous and most powerful towns she contributed more than one-half of the whole federal taxation she had the right of naming the ambassadors at paris stockholm and vienna the fact that the states-general met on her territory at the hague necessarily gave her additional influence and prestige it was through her energy that the attempt of william the second had proved abortive she now stepped into the vacant place with the stadtholder's power that of the states-general also as representing the idea of centralization had largely disappeared the provincial estates of holland therefore under the title of their high mightinesses became the principal power to such an extent indeed that the term holland had by the time of the restoration become synonymous among foreign powers with the whole republic their chief minister was called the grand pensionary and the office had been since sixteen fifty three filled by one of the most remarkable men of the time john de witt john de witt therefore represented roughly speaking the power of the merchant aristocracy of holland as opposed to the claims of the house of orange which were supported by the noblesse the army the calvinistic clergy and the people below the governing class abroad the orange family had the sympathy of monarchical governments louis the fourteenth despised the government of monsieur le marchand while charles the second at once the uncle and the guardian of the young prince of the house of orange the future william the third of england and mindful of the scant courtesy which to satisfy cromwell the dutch had shown him in exile was ever their bitter and unscrupulous foe the empire of the dutch republic was purely commercial and colonial and she held in this respect the same position relative to the rest of europe that england holds at the present day to this supremacy many causes had contributed her geographical position between northern and southern europe the rivers from central europe reaching the sea on her shores her extended coastline 
made her a convenient centre for the reception and distribution of the wealth of all the lands of the earth the natural barrenness of the land and the incessant struggle to keep a footing against the inroads of the ocean had formed a thrifty hardy and patient race while the abundant fisheries on her coasts had made of a large part of her population the most skilful and daring sailors of the world speedily her fleets went farther afield as early as fifteen twenty three no fewer than two thousand vessels making three voyages a year were reaping rich harvests in english and scotch fishing grounds in fifteen forty seven eight ships of war attended to defend them from attack and in sixteen thirty five such importance did the dutch attach to this source of their wealth that they paid a sum of thirty thousand pounds for permission to fish that summer in the english waters but meantime and chiefly from a cause of a different nature the trade of the world had been gradually drifting into their hands while central europe was being desolated by the thirty years war the united provinces formed a haven of rest for industry and while every other nation was driving out by war or religious persecution the best of her working population the exiles found a ready welcome in a land in which religious toleration was a fundamental law under this constant influx of skill and enterprise aided by a wise commercial policy the wealth of the country increased with vast rapidity while through her navies developed out of the fishing fleet and formed of vessels which though far roomier than those of other countries were manned with fewer hands she was year by year acquiring a colonial empire in every continent and absorbing the carrying trade of the world in sixteen o four raleigh in a remarkable memoir to james i complained that english enterprise was confined to fetching coals from newcastle to london and at the same date the fleets of the republic were to be found in the east indies the moluccas java guinea ceylon the malaccas sumatra the cape of good hope brazil the coromandel coast malabar and had captured the chief portuguese possessions in asia and africa by sixteen sixty nine john de witt was able with truth to say that the hollanders had well nigh beaten all nations by traffic out of the seas and become the only carriers of goods throughout the world and in sixteen seventy their position is thus described in the lex mercatoria the commerce of holland which may be termed universal reassembles in the united provinces this infinite number of merchandises which it afterwards diffuses in all the rest of europe it produces hardly anything and yet has wherewith to furnish other people all they can have need of it is without forests and almost without wood and there is not seen anywhere else so many carpenters which work in naval construction its lands are not fit for the culture of vines and it is the staple or mart of wines which are gathered in all parts of the world and of brandies drawn from them it has no mines nor metals and yet there is found almost as much gold and silver as in new spain or peru as much iron as in france as much tin as in england and as much copper as in sweden the wheat and grains that are there sowed hardly suffice for nourishment of a part of its inhabitants and it is notwithstanding from hence that the greatest part of its neighbours receive them either for their subsistence or their trade in fine it seems as if the spices grew there that the oils were gathered there that it nourished the precious insects which spin the silk and that all sorts of drugs for medicine or dyeing were in the number of its products and of its growth its warehouses are so full and its merchants seem to carry so much to strangers that there is not a day that ships do not come in or go out and frequently entire fleets this is the more remarkable as in sixteen fifty one a rude blow had been struck at the commercial supremacy of the dutch in that year the famous act of navigation had been passed in england by which it was provided that no merchandise the product of asia africa or america should be imported into england in any but english-built ships 
commanded by an English master, and navigated by a crew, three-fourths of whom should be Englishmen, nor any European goods except in English ships or in ships belonging to the countries from which these articles originally came no fish might be exported from or imported into england or ireland except of english taking by this law the carrying trade with england was utterly destroyed it led to a repetition of the great duel between the two countries in sixteen fifty two tromp to signify his power to sweep the seas sailed down the channel with a broom at his masthead naval battles the like of which had never been seen filled the next two years but in sixteen fifty four when the masterfulness of cromwell and the genius of blake had finally triumphed the republic was forced to make peace on terms which showed that the command of the sea was passing to her enemy not only was she compelled to assent to the navigation act as well as to other conditions no less humiliating but she even agreed that dutch ships as well of war as others meeting any of the ships of war of the english commonwealth in the british seas shall strike their flag and lower their topsails it was not to be expected that with her traditions and resources she would contentedly bear this badge of inferiority her feeling at the time of the restoration was a burning desire to recover her old position end of section twelve section thirteen of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter ten louis and the spanish netherlands number one negotiations with de witt it was obviously of importance to louis to secure at least the benevolent neutrality of the republic should he decide to carry out his enterprise on the spanish netherlands de witt in like manner was looking round for support in case the personal antipathy of charles the second and the rivalry between the dutch and english should lead to a renewal of war while foreseeing a moment when he might have upon his frontier no longer the nerveless power of spain but the victorious armies of france he was anxious to avoid the chance of this force being turned against the republic under these feelings a treaty was easily concluded in april sixteen sixty two whereby france and the republic guaranteed each other's european possessions with their commercial and maritime interests and arranged for mutual defence if attacked liberty of fishing was reciprocally granted and france agreed to levy no more import duties upon dutch shipping de witt's immediate object however was by all means to keep the spanish low countries as a barrier between the united provinces and the oncoming power of france but he could take no overt step until louis had acknowledged the designs which he had already guessed to secure this acknowledgment became therefore the object of his diplomacy three plans had been put forward for the treatment of the spanish low countries richelieu had favoured the plan of cantonment by which they were to be formed into an independent catholic republic mazarin was bent upon their becoming part of the french dominions the dutch had more than once suggested equal partition with france but as the power of france grew more threatening the dutch in their anxiety to have her amicum sed non wickenum leaned more and more to the plan of cantonment and even affected to listen to a fourth proposal by spain that the ten spanish provinces should form a defensive league with the republic louis was as anxious to avoid a premature disclosure of his design as de witt was to extract it the astuteness of the grand pensionary however secured the first diplomatic success he formally pressed upon louis various solutions of the difficulty especially that of partial cantonment by which france and the republic should each take the strategic towns on their respective frontiers while the rest of the country became an independent republic he represented that the great dutch towns tempted by the spanish promises of wide commercial privileges were so eager for the defensive league just mentioned 
that he should not be able much longer to withstand the clamour and he declared that however friendly he might personally be to french interests he could not actively assist them until louis's intentions were distinctly expressed after many months of diplomatic fencing he was rewarded for once off his guard louis permitted d'estrade the french ambassador to place the devolution claim formally before de witt de witt having unmasked louis at once changed his tone he replied that the claim founded upon a purely local custom of brabant could not be entertained for a moment and in spite of louis's haughty anger he exposed his reasons for so treating it in a most able historical memoir then coming boldly to the point he declared that a pursuance of the design would drive him to accept the spanish league moreover he said the emperor now contracted to the infanta possessed a claim of at least equal right in the eyes of europe and he should be ready therefore to entertain proposals from vienna firm however as was de witt's tone he was surrounded by difficulties the activity of the partisans of the house of orange was daily increasing and he knew that the acceptance of the spanish league would excite their most vehement opposition and imperil his own power he was however released from the need of fully declaring himself by the action of the principal towns which refused to concur in the plan of partial cantonment on the special ground that the continuance of the closure of the scheldt by which measure the trade of their great commercial rival antwerp had been effectually crippled was not provided for freed from the necessity of further entertaining the french scheme de witt now succeeded in convincing the towns of the inadvisability of accepting the spanish proposal he thus secured a full knowledge of the ultimate objects of louis without being bound to any definite course louis too was well satisfied the spanish league had been the one thing he feared and that danger was past the republic was for the time driven to inaction he himself was sure of his own power to strike when the proper moment should come and though the devolution claim had been unhesitatingly rejected by de witt the great advantage had been gained of making it familiar to men's minds he now pursued his design in another quarter number two death of philip the fourth rejection of the french claims louis and spain day by day spain was falling into greater decrepitude her treasury was exhausted her armies unequipped and inefficient her navy had practically ceased to exist her diplomacy was despised the failure to reconquer portugal became ever more apparent and she was even compelled to stand idle while the moors insulted her coasts with impunity philip the fourth looked forward with acute pain to the disruption which threatened his kingdom it was more than doubtful whether his infant son should survive himself the unhappy boy appeared indeed in his physical infirmities to be no inappropriate symbol of the condition of the monarchy to which he was heir at four years of age he was still at his nurse's breast his head was not properly formed neither his hair nor teeth were grown he was unable to walk without assistance and he was incessantly subject to fevers eruptions and bleedings philip had determined to secure what support he could for the tottering monarchy by marrying the young infanta margaret elizabeth to the emperor leopold naming her at the same time heir to the monarchy should the male line become extinct to the exclusion of all other claims and the contract was signed on december eighteenth sixteen sixty three the news of the intended marriage had been announced to louis in may he coldly replied that he trusted it would entail no conditions prejudicial to his interests affairs in the portuguese war had meanwhile been going from bad to worse on january eighteenth sixteen sixty three the spaniards had been severely beaten in great measure through the generalship of the frenchman schomberg and the valour of the english contingent the campaign of sixteen sixty four though not marked by any decisive battle 
was little less disastrous in sixteen sixty five a final effort was determined upon and caracena esteemed the best spanish general of the day was called from his governorship of the low countries to take the command nothing however could stay the ever hastening descent on june seventeenth was fought the great and decisive battle of villa viciosa resulting in the utter defeat of the spanish army the blow killed philip the fourth he let the dispatch which brought the tidings drop from his hand exclaiming it is god's will and daily and visibly fell to his grave he died on september seventeenth sixteen sixty five spain however still possessed men who refused to accept all as lost upon the removal of caracena the low countries had been placed under the marquis of castel rodrigo skilful enterprising and devoted to his country he determined so far as the want of money or decent government at madrid would allow to place his province in a condition to meet an attack from france to create a chain of forts which should replace those which the peace of the pyrenees had put into french hands and in every way to expel french influence were his great objects his first general order forbade the inhabitants to wear the french dress or to follow the french fashion of the hair not until he applied to the emperor for leave to raise troops in germany did he give louis an excuse for interference the use of the conditions inserted in the treaty of westphalia and of louis's bond with the german princes was at once apparent he wrote to those whose territories blocked the road into the low countries urging them to refuse a passage to the troops and at the same time made such vehement complaints at madrid that orders were sent to castel rodrigo to drop this part of his plans the governor then proceeded to carry out a long contemplated scheme by the peace of the pyrenees louis had acquired a free passage across the lys at st venant to render this acquisition useless castel rodrigo determined to turn the course of the river by a canal starting above the town which would have left it high and dry and placed a new water defence between him and france once more however louis complained at madrid and once more the harassed and enfeebled court gave way the terms of philip the fourth's will were looked to with utmost anxiety by louis they were found to justify that anxiety to the full the succession was left first to the young prince charles and his descendants then to the infanta and her children not a word was said as to the french claims but the dowry provided by the treaty of the pyrenees was to be paid in full had louis's hands been free he would doubtless now have pressed his devolution claim to the low countries which the spanish council had unanimously rejected but he was for the moment embarrassed he was at war with england in compliance with his treaty of april sixteen sixty two with the dutch he was too engaged in a diplomatic dispute with sweden and in a quarrel with the pope and complications had arisen in savoy he again saw himself compelled to wait End of section 13section fourteen of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter eleven england persecution of dissent the dutch war part one number one the king's attempt to favour popery the english parliament had separated in may of sixteen sixty two gratified by their triumph over the presbyterians in the corporation and uniformity acts they met again in february sixteen sixty three to find themselves confronted by an enemy whom they feared and detested with a still keener hate and terror the dominant factor in the feverish politics of this reign is to be found in the feeling of the ordinary english mind regarding popery the churchman might despise and persecute the presbyterian the presbyterian like the scots might regard the other sects as advocates of the devil himself but in all of them hatred of popery was the master impulse fox's book of martyrs was favourite reading 
and the fires of smithfield were in the english imagination still alight another armada seemed to hang like a dark cloud upon our shores and a fresh gunpowder plot might at any moment burst forth there was no atrocity which was not natural to the papists the very debauchery of the court was laid to their charge and the cry which greeted the early christians in rome christianos ad leones never rang in their ears more pitilessly than the execrations which when the panic rose to its height were hurled at the bloody papists to the englishman then it was the first duty of his king to hate and combat this last and insolentest attempt on the credulity of mankind but first to his astonishment and then to his indignant fury he found or thought he found that charles was of altogether another mind charles indeed had abundant reasons for wishing to alleviate the lot of the catholics he was himself a catholic had been befriended while in exile by catholic princes and had made promises of favour which he earnestly wished to fulfil among his father's most faithful adherents had been many of the proscribed creed and more than others they had been the mark for fine imprisonment and confiscation he was at this very time in formal communication with innocent the eleventh for a reconstitution of the english church whereby while retaining its national and independent character it should nominally acknowledge the holy see as its head these considerations had led to his former attempt to put off the execution of the act of uniformity for three months he now repeated the attempt on december twenty sixth sixteen sixty two during the recess he issued a declaration expressing his intention of doing his best to induce parliament to mitigate the rigour of that measure and to concur with him in making some act for that purpose as may enable him to exercise with a more universal satisfaction that power of dispensing which he conceived to be inherent in him this declaration drew from sheldon a letter in which the iniquity of the proposal as tending to set up that most damnable and heretical doctrine of the church of rome whore of babylon was set before him in the plainest language undeterred the king met parliament on february eighteenth sixteen sixty three with a speech in which he declared himself in nature an enemy to all severity for religion and conscience and while asserting that he had no intention of favouring the papists though he owed them gratitude and admitted their claims to indulgence and desiring that laws might be made to hinder the spread of their doctrine he asked for such a power of indulgence to use upon occasions as might not needlessly force them out of the kingdom or give them cause to conspire against its peace before the words were well out of the king's mouth all men saw before them in tangible shape the enemy they dreaded most they had kept out the fox said william coventry were they now to let the wolf into the fold they did not know that charles was himself a catholic but there was much going on to cause suspicion and in every place where he wrote dissent the english mind read pope of rome he was not long left in ignorance of the feelings he had roused within a week the commons answered his appeal in a remonstrance of the boldest character such an indulgence they said will establish schism by a law it will no way become the gravity or the wisdom of a parliament to pass a law at one session for uniformity and at the next session the reason for uniformity continuing just the same to pass another law to frustrate or weaken the execution of it it will expose your majesty to the restless importunity of every sect or opinion it will be a cause of increasing sects and sectaries whose members will weaken the protestant profession so far that it will become difficult for it to defend itself against them and in time some prevalent sect will at last contend for an establishment which for aught can be foreseen may end in popery charles now knew the conditions on which he might expect to continue to rule at all hazards popery was to be kept out of the kingdom by the maintenance of a dominant state church a bill introduced in the house of lords enabling him to dispense with the act of uniformity was to his great disgust 
opposed by clarendon and southampton and had ultimately to be dropped he was made to understand that supply would depend upon the immediate issue of a proclamation banishing all catholic priests and he yielded then taking him at his word as to hindering the growth of papacy the parliament heartily laboured therein he now however put an end to the session his object was to keep the matter as far as possible in his own hands and to secure the sympathy of the dissenters but he saw how keen was the anger caused by the overconfident tone of the catholics who had thought themselves secure in his favour and before the houses separated he promised that he would in the next session himself suggest bills for realising the purpose which the parliament had at heart on other questions the reaction against the principles of the long parliament was still in full force the triennial act had secured parliamentary government by declaring that if the king did not summon a fresh parliament within three years from a dissolution the peers were to undertake the duty if they failed the sheriffs of each county and in the last resort the electors themselves an impression had got about that this meant that no parliament might sit for more than three years skilfully availing himself of this to raise jealousy in a body whose continuance was thus threatened and using to the utmost the influence of bribes and of the king's friends as those members who were attached to the court were called charles so prepared the ground that on the reassembling of the houses in march of sixteen sixty four he ventured to tell them that much as he was in love with parliaments he never would suffer a parliament to come together by the means prescribed by that bill anxious no doubt to narrow the scope of their differences with the king the commons while reasserting the principle of the triennial bill removed from it all the precautions which had given it efficacy the result of this abandonment of a strong position was not shown until the end of the reign when for the last four years the king ruled absolutely and without a parliament number two persecution of protestant dissent the commons then resumed their favourite work the act of uniformity had of course led to the establishment of unauthorised religious meetings or conventicles against which the anglican clergy and the commons invade as hotbeds of schism and sedition charles ever unwilling to maintain resistance where attack was persistent and anxious for a supply gave his assent to the first conventicle act this iniquitous measure which was to be in force for three years first renewed the act of uniformity of elizabeth it then absolutely forbade meetings of more than four persons besides the household for religious services other than those allowed by the church three months imprisonment or a fine of five pounds for the first offence a double penalty for the second banishment for seven years to the american plantations or a fine of one hundred pounds for the third and death for return or escape were the penalties of the act sheriffs justices of the peace or any persons commissioned by them were authorized to break up conventicles and imprison at will any who were present at or who permitted the meetings even married women were liable to a year's imprisonment unless their husbands paid a fine of forty shillings many devices were resorted to for evading these provisions sometimes where houses were joined a hole was cut in the wall so that two or three congregations each within the limits of the act might listen to a sermon in the records of the baptist congregation at broadmead near bristol we read of a conventicle being held in an upper room the stairs being purposely packed so closely with women that the sheriff and his officers were unable to force their way up until time had been given for the minister and his congregation to escape by another way nevertheless the sufferings were very great upon the quakers who from the novelty and peculiarity of their doctrines were more suspected and obtained less popular sympathy than any others the blow fell with special weight pepys on august seventh sixteen sixty four relates how he saw several being dragged through the streets and his only comment is they go like lambs without any resistance i would to god they would conform or be more wise and not be catched 
before a year was over an act still more cruel and drastic was carried in the commons without a division though again opposed in the lords during the desolation of the plague many of the clergy had fled without authorization the deposed presbyterian ministers stepped into their pulpits and once more gathered eager congregations but the vigilance of the anglican church was not asleep the old cry was raised of schism and rebellion at the october session at oxford in sixteen sixty five it was determined to prepare a shibboleth a test to distinguish among those who will be peaceable and give hopes of future conformity and who of malice and evil disposition remain obdurate once more the pressing need of supplies compelled charles to give way for consenting to the five mile act he obtained a grant of a million and a quarter no nonconformist minister was permitted henceforth to teach in schools or to come within five miles of any city corporate town or parliamentary borough unless he had previously subscribed an oath denying the lawfulness of taking arms under any circumstances against the king or those commissioned by him and declaring that he would not at any time endeavour any alteration of government in church or state the penalty was six months imprisonment or a fine of forty pounds the infamous trade of informer which had been created by the conventicle act and which was so odious a feature of the reign was encouraged by the promise of one-third of the fine exacted it was too actually proposed and the motion was only defeated by six votes that this oath should be imposed upon the whole nation the machinery of persecution was now complete the corporation and uniformity acts had settled forever the limits of the church the conventicle and five mile acts were the answer of the church to the claim of dissent not to legal recognition but to the right to exist number three causes of the dutch war while the anglican church was exacting to the utmost the vengeance she deemed her right for the injuries of twenty years and was asserting the supremacy which was to exist in the same tyrannous form for nearly two centuries the country was reeling under the stress of a great naval war england and the dutch republic were now engaged in the second part of that tremendous contest for the commercial supremacy of the world of which the first had been fought out between tromp and blake the peace of sixteen fifty four had not only left the causes of enmity untouched but in the confessions of inferiority exacted from a high-spirited people had established the certainty of a renewal of the conflict the mutual advantages which the protector and de witt received from their alliance had indeed secured the continuance of peace during the commonwealth and in september sixteen sixty two in spite of the navigation act a fresh treaty had been concluded between the two nations this treaty in itself however only served to advance the date of a rupture it gave a mutual liberty of fishing to both countries but otherwise it was almost solely to the advantage of england the invidious demand for the salute by dutch ships to the english flag in english waters was repeated and allowed Polaroon, the richest of the molucca islands was nominally restored to england and it was agreed that neither country should afford protection to the rebels of the other but while the forms of amity were thus preserved between the two governments the nations themselves were actually in fierce and incessant strife in every quarter of the globe the committee of trade reported to the commons that the english were almost driven out of the east and west indies turkey and africa with a loss during the last few years of seven millions sterling wherever the dutch had influence they compelled the natives to close their ports against their rivals polaroon had not been handed over according to the treaty and the english had been deprived of the lucrative slave trade from the guinea coast to the barbados on april second sixteen sixty four the house presented a petition to the king for the speedy redress of these wrongs and unanimously expressed their willingness to assist him with their lives and fortunes the dutch were in a state of equal irritation the acquisition of bombay by england in accordance with the treaty with portugal had especially roused their jealousy in the spring of sixteen sixty four robert holmes sailed on a filibustering expedition along the african coast 
he captured eleven merchant vessels and ousted the dutch from goree cape de verde cape corso and many other places in america the dutch west india company had for forty years possessed long island and the opposite coast from the connecticut river to delaware bay a force under colonel nicholas drove them out and charles after changing the name of new amsterdam to new york handed the country over to his brother james tobago and other good harbours in the antilles were similarly wrested from the zealand settlers the dutch were not idle under these aggressions de ruyter was sent to the african coast with orders to make war on the english and to do them all the harm he could in october he captured the english vessels at goree and took all their posts on the guinea coast except cape corso the english retaliated by cutting off the dutch bordeaux fleet and after a severe action part of that from smyrna also all dutch ships lying in british harbours were seized as prizes thus the nations necessarily drifted into formal war must we said the dutch envoy to monk sacrifice our commerce to yours whatever happens replied monk we must have our part or the peace will not last even had the rulers been anxious for peace it could not have been maintained but every private and family feeling in charles's mind was enlisted against the dutch he disliked them personally and he declared that his honour required him to be their enemy since cromwell had been their ally his brother james an eager advocate of england's commercial interests who hated the dutch as a calvinistic people and who was ambitious of naval glory sedulously cultivated these feelings charles moreover saw in the outbreak of war a chance of a liberal supply and trusted that the binding influence of a great national crisis might bring to his side the classes disaffected to the government de witt similarly hoped to find in the contest a means of frustrating the intrigues of the orange faction number four preparations of england and the republic the declaration of war by england in march of sixteen sixty five found the crown the people and the parliament for once in complete harmony a supply of two million five hundred thousand pounds the largest money grant hitherto given by an english parliament was unanimously voted and charles's terms to the dutch rose in proportion he demanded compensation for injuries to british commerce the possession of various ports as pledges for payment the right of search of all foreign ships in the channel and the renunciation by the dutch of their fishing rights in british waters men talked of giving the law to the whole trade of christendom and of making all ships which passed through the narrow seas pay toll to england the number of vessels with their armaments which the dutch were to be allowed to keep was mentioned the din of preparation resounded in every dockyard in the kingdom commissioners were appointed in the principal ports for the sale of prizes and it was declared that all ships no matter from what country they sailed were liable to capture if there were three dutch sailors on board privateers were let loose in swarms the war it was said must support itself no less high was the spirit of the dutch heavy taxes were cheerfully voted the navy was brought to its utmost efficiency especially in the quality of the guns and the army as far as possible was reorganized entrenched batteries were erected at all the exposed points of the coast the peasants were armed to resist a possible landing the sailors were to receive increased rations and liberal pensions were voted for the families of all who should fall large rewards were offered for the capture of prizes and two thousand pounds for that of the admiral's flagship for any captain who should strike to the enemy or retire without orders there was to be but one penalty death de witt now claimed from louis the fulfilment of the treaty of april sixteen sixty two louis however was much embarrassed he was afraid that the war might spread and that he might be thereby hampered in his design on the spanish low countries moreover by declaring for the dutch he would lose england and from england he had the widest hopes for charles had given him to understand that as far as he was concerned france might have a free hand in the netherlands on the contrary if he allowed the dutch to succumb de witt would be overthrown the house of orange would be triumphant and the republic would fall politically into dependence upon england the first great action had taken place 
before he had made a move to redeem his promises. End of section 14. Section 15 of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 11 England, Persecution of Dissent, The Dutch War, Part 2. Number 5 The War, 1665. In spite of the disorder which reigned at the Admiralty, so vividly described by Pepys, an English fleet such as had never been gathered together before was ready for sea in the spring of 1665. No fewer than 109 large vessels with 30 of smaller size, manned by 21,000 men, many of them old Commonwealth sailors, and armed with 4,192 guns, sailed under the command of james the dutch fleet under the veteran optum was of the same size but manned with more numerous crews and armed with heavier guns this superiority was however corrected by the greater knowledge of the art of sea warfare which the english had learnt under blake nothing says an eyewitness can equal the good order of the english their line is perfect and thus an enemy who comes near them has to undergo their whole fire they fight like a line of cavalry in perfect discipline whilst with the dutch the various squadrons leave their ranks and come separately to the charge the fleets met off lowestoft at four a m on june third the explosion of opdam's vessel was the turning point of the battle and the dutch withdrew in confusion tromp with his squadron alone keeping up the fight but for the negligence of the English in ceasing the pursuit during the night, the hostile fleet would have been annihilated. As it was, the Dutch had lost, besides the admiral, three vice-admirals, nineteen first-rates, and seven thousand men. The English loss was four ships and fifteen hundred men, that in officers, as in all the battles of this war, being proportionately great the medals struck in london to celebrate the victory bore the proud motto et pontus servoyet for a time deep discouragement weighed upon the dutch but the spirit of de witt rose with disaster the penalties due for flight were sternly meted out three captains were shot six more were degraded and had their swords broken above their heads a superb mausoleum was raised at the hague in honour of the dead light vessels put out to warn the different merchant fleets at sea Rowder arrived opportunely with his guinea squadron while the east indian and mediterranean fleets also reached holland with but small loss meanwhile the dutch had been attacked from another side bernard van galen bishop of munster was the last representative of those warrior prelates who had been conspicuous in the middle ages his youth had been passed in the army and his vast wealth enabled him to indulge the military taste which he had retained his position on the dutch frontier gave him at this time special importance and charles the second who knew that he had standing causes of jealousy with his neighbours had skilfully secured his assistance in june sixteen sixty five an alliance had been concluded by which in return for a heavy subsidy the bishop engaged to maintain an army of thirty thousand men and to attack the dutch within two months the republic was almost incapable of resistance the fortifications were out of repair the best troops were on board the fleet and she could oppose this attack with but seven thousand untrained men the bishop entered dutch territory took zutphen and overran the province of overissel upon the sea however the dutch had once more asserted their supremacy a fresh fleet raised by the efforts of de witt had sailed in the midst of the stormy season to challenge their foes wherever they might be found the challenge was in vain london was panic-stricken by the plague the crews of the english fleet were themselves infected and the sixty ships at the mouth of the thames lay sullenly inactive the dutch were compelled at length to return to their own shores without firing a gun none the less 
the expedition had served to raise the courage of their country and to show the english how far they still were from the victory to which they had so confidently looked forward number six dutch alliances de witt now again pressed louis to fulfil his treaty engagements otherwise he threatened that he would make peace and enter into close alliance with the english for louis this meant a serious obstacle to the carrying out of his great project he was moreover nettled at the coolness with which charles the second had in the flush of a first success treated his offers of mediation he therefore declared his intention of sending a fleet to join the dutch in the north sea and at the same time maintaining a squadron in the mediterranean he promised to employ his diplomacy in their favour wherever he had influence in europe and to assist their intrigues with all charles's discontented subjects as soon as he was informed of charles's treaty with the bishop of munster he sent a corps to join the dutch troops who were resisting the prelate the conduct of the french showed however how little their sympathies lay with their nominal allies they behaved as if they were in a hostile country they pillaged the people and insulted their religion they openly cursed the dutch cause and they drank publicly in the market-place of maastricht to the healths of the king of england and the bishop of munster the french commander successfully avoided every favourable opportunity for attacking the bishop's troops and indeed acted in such a way as to raise to the utmost the ill-will already existing between the two nations nevertheless the fact that france was in alliance with the dutch and had actually declared war against england january sixteen sixty six had given far greater weight to the diplomacy of the states-general they baffled charles's ambassador in sweden and succeeded in restraining that country from joining england they formed with denmark an alliance february eleventh sixteen sixty six by which she bound herself to place forty ships at their disposal the elector of brandenburg february sixteenth sixteen sixty six promised to force the bishop to make peace and the heads of the house of brunswick luneberg in consequence offered their good will heavy subsidies were paid by the dutch in each case the result was that the warlike bishop was compelled april sixteen sixty six to renounce the english alliance and to sign an ignominious peace when the rival fleets again put to sea in the early summer of sixteen sixty six england was without an ally from bergen to bayonne there was not a friendly port open to her ships six months later october twenty seventh sixteen sixty six after the campaign which has now to be described these different treaties were completed and confirmed by a closer defensive alliance for ten years between the republic denmark brandenburg and brunswick luneburg by which each power agreed to assist the others with all its forces in case of new aggression it thus relieved the republic from her dangerous dependence on louis and it was the first sign of that tendency to coalition against france which henceforward is so marked a feature of the politics of europe number seven the war sixteen sixty six meantime great events had been passing on the sea on june first sixteen sixty six the fleets had met off the dunes and during four days had waged the most terrible sea fight in history Rauder and tromp with one hundred vessels were confronted by an english fleet under monk rendered greatly inferior in numbers by the necessity of dispatching rupert with twenty vessels to meet the french fleet which louis however who only desired to see the two great naval powers destroying one another carefully kept back the battle raged from midday until dusk some idea of the slaughter may be gathered from the fact that in an english vessel which went into action with three hundred men but forty were left alive at six next morning the contest was renewed the day's fighting won against the smaller fleet and monk fell back sullenly and in perfect order toward the english coast the next day however rupert rejoined him and thus strengthened the english prepared for a third struggle 
Router summoned all his captains to his own vessel and told them that upon the issue of that day depended not only their own fate but that of the Republic. Fighting began at nine in the morning and lasted with desperation for six hours without advantage to either side. Then Router hoisted the red flag, the signal for a general and final effort. With such desperate valor was he obeyed that he twice pierced his enemy's line. Still, it was only after incessant fighting, lasting till dusk, that the English gave way, and so shattered was his own fleet that he did not attempt to pursue his advantage. He had lost three vice admirals, two thousand men, and four ships. On the English side, five thousand men had been killed and three thousand taken prisoners. Eight ships of the line had been sunk or burnt, and nine more remained in the hands of the Dutch. Almost without the loss of a day, each side prepared to renew the struggle. The Dutch sailed from the Tessel on July 4th. Before the end of the month, an English armament, the finest and best equipped that had left her shores, sallied from the Thames. On August 4th, Monk and Router met off the Norfolk coast to try conclusions once more. After another long day of carnage, the Dutch, this time decisively beaten, sought safety in confusion in the shallows of Zealand. The English signalized their mastery by a daring and successful act. In the harbour of Flea, at the entrance of the Zuiderzee, 160 merchant ships were riding in apparent safety. A single English frigate, followed by five fire ships, managed to penetrate the narrow passages. The fire ships were let loose, and the whole fleet, with the exception of nine vessels, was destroyed. The loss was estimated at a million sterling. Internal troubles were at the same time pressing upon De Witt. As misfortunes gathered round the Republic, men's thoughts turned more strongly to the family under whom the early greatness of their country had been achieved. Five provinces with Zealand, the second in influence, at their head, now declared for peace and for the restoration of the House of Orange. Even in Holland, De Witt's own province, the cause made way. Harlem and Leyden were unanimous for the prince. It was demanded that he should be named captain general of the cavalry and should have a place in the council of state other towns urged that the republic should adopt him as the child of the state and undertake his education lest he should grow up in english principles unable otherwise to nullify the intrigues of the adherents of the prince of orange de witt determined to follow this last suggestion he himself undertook as Mazarin had formerly done with Louis, to instruct the prince in the art of government. Already the intelligence, power of dissimulation, and persistence of William's character was such as to strike an intelligent observer. In other respects De Witt was in good hope. Not only had his indomitable energy enabled him once more to send forth a fleet, which in vain challenged Rupert at the mouth of the Thames, and thus restored the honour of the flag, but he found that England was herself anxious for peace. London was in ruins from the fire. The navy, despite its late successes, was in a desperate condition. The state of the treasury compelled Charles to retrench his expenses. This he did, not by any diminution in the shameless extravagance of his pleasures, but by starving the navy to such an extent that although Parliament had made another grant of one million eight hundred thousand pounds, England, was obliged to act strictly on the defensive, the sole office of her warships as in the days of James I, being to convey the colliers from Newcastle to London. From the Scotch came bitter outcries at the strangling of their trade, which, owing to the rigorous protection laws of England, was almost exclusively with the Dutch. Ireland was equally distressed, while as for England herself, her feelings were shown by the address of the speaker on january eighteenth sixteen sixty seven who alluding to the terrible exhaustion of the kingdom prayed charles in the name of the people to put an end to this desolating war evidently says clarendon the dutch could endure being beaten longer than england could endure to beat them charles seized the opportunity of returning to his natural personal connection with france in february sixteen sixty seven 
lord st albans was secretly sent to paris to conclude an engagement on the basis that england should enter into no connection during sixteen sixty seven with the house of austria while louis was to support all charles's interests in or out of the kingdom the final form which this intrigue took an intrigue kept entirely secret from the english ministers and contained only in autograph letters from both monarchs to the queen mother in whose house the negotiations had taken place was number one each pledged himself not to enter during a year into any alliance contrary to the interests of the other number two louis agreed to hold back the fleet with which he had promised to help the dutch and number three charles was to allow him a free hand in the spanish low countries number eight the dutch in the thames treaty of breda sweden having offered her mediation a conference met in may sixteen sixty seven at the neutral town of breda for a long while it was found impossible to come to terms exhausted as both nations were neither had reduced the other sufficiently to gain the commercial advantage on which they were bent it was now that de witt looking anxiously across the frontier to the spanish low countries into which louis had already marched determined upon a decisive stroke suddenly on june seventh when charles was at a drunken revel at the duchess of monmouth's all mad in hunting of a poor moth the sound of guns was heard in the thames it was the dutch fleet of sixty-one men of war which under Router and John de Witt's brother Cornelius had come to revenge upon England the insult of Flie. Mounting the Thames as far as Gravesend, and driving the English vessels before them, they took Sheerness, sailed as far as Upner, and along the Medway to Rochester, burnt three English men of war, and succeeded in capturing the Royal Charles, which was taken in triumph to Holland then Router sailed proudly along our coasts vainly challenging a contest at harwich portsmouth torbay dartmouth and plymouth the immediate effect of this daring blow was to extort peace on july thirty first sixteen sixty seven the treaty of breda was signed and a month later ratified its terms were the terms of a drawn battle each nation was to retain all conquests made both before and during the war up to may tenth sixteen sixty seven either in territory or ships and the treaty of sixteen sixty two was annulled the effect of this was that england kept new york and the dutch suriname and polaroon the act of navigation was so far relaxed that dutch vessels were allowed to bring dutch german and flemish goods into english ports the salute to english men of war in british waters was again allowed but only as a matter of courtesy the treaty of sixteen sixty two as far as it regarded commerce was renewed each country was to protect the other against all enemies whatsoever at the same time treaties were made by england with france and denmark france restored st christopher and gave up antigua and montserrat england restored acadia or nova scotia denmark was admitted to commercial equality the great struggle for the command of the sea and the commerce of the world was over for the time only because the combatants exhausted and bleeding needed repose it had decided nothing and left behind it hatred and mistrust but hatred and mistrust yield to the pressure of a common danger even before peace was concluded all eyes had been turned from breda to the victorious march of louis's armies the era of french aggression in europe had begun End of section fifteen section sixteen of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter twelve diplomacy and preparations of louis invasion of spanish netherlands number one french treaties with portugal and the rhine princes the years of the dutch war had been on louis's part a time of incessant diplomatic activity in preparation for the great design himself distinguished by all the qualities which mark a master of statecraft
he was served with implicit obedience by a corps of the most accomplished diplomats that europe had yet seen Lyon in paris ruvigny and colbert in london de gremonville in vienna the archbishop of ambrun in madrid pompon and d'estrade in sweden and the united provinces these and many like them had except in de witt lisola and perhaps arlington no rivals well might a baffled english envoy at madrid exclaim france has the gift of persuading what she pleases here as in the rest of christendom by his nominal alliance with the dutch louis had prevented them from taking measures against an aggression which would bring him to their frontier and by restraining his own fleet had prevented them from crushing their rival when england seemed to be preponderating he had on the other hand been instrumental in gaining for the republic in sixteen sixty six the alliances which had helped to give her heart for another effort he had secured from charles while peace was still pending a secret and personal engagement which assured the neutrality of england for a time sufficient for his immediate purpose but previously to this he had scored against her a brilliant diplomatic success in the peninsula by counteracting her endeavours to bring about peace between portugal and spain and by forcing from the former an offensive alliance with himself by this treaty march thirty first sixteen sixty seven it was agreed that for a heavy subsidy armed help against spain louis's guarantee of any treaty she might make with spain after spain herself had made peace with france and his promise to compel spain to grant the title of king to her ruler portugal should actively carry on the war should grant considerable commercial advantages to france and should listen to no proposals from spain until france herself made peace he thus secured a potent source of distraction to spain whenever he might choose to strike his blow secure of england the republic and portugal there now remained for louis only one possible opposition of importance to neutralize from leopold chief of the austrian house on account of his near relationship to spain the former connection of the countries and the proximity of the spanish low countries to his own dominions the liveliest resentment might be expected the means to counteract this difficulty at any rate for a time had already been provided by mazarin in sixteen fifty eight by the formation of the rhine league which renewed its constitution every three years and was still in existence in august sixteen sixty seven louis had too in sixteen sixty four formed separate alliances with the king of sweden the grand elector of brandenburg and the electors of saxony and mayence cemented by large subsidies he had thus made himself in a great measure the arbiter of german affairs and took frequent occasion to assert his position naturally however as thus fettered the emperor grew less and less formidable to the princes of the empire these bonds had become relaxed jealousy of france was taking the place of jealousy of the emperor and in sixteen sixty seven it seemed doubtful whether another prolongation of three years of the rhine league would be secured louis therefore at once october twenty eighth sixteen sixty seven made secretly at heavy cost fresh alliances with the princes along the rhine the electors of mayence and cologne the duke of neuburg and the bishop of munster by which they engaged to refuse a passage to austrian troops at the same time he stirred up disaffection among the emperor's discontented subjects in hungary hoping thus to distract his attention as in the case of spain he had done by the help of portugal number two invasion of the low countries never did a fairer prospect present itself to an ambitious monarch france was at this moment beyond comparison the best administered country in europe the wounds of the fronde had been healed and all classes seemed in contentment the energy and determination of louis himself were ably seconded by the devotion of the great administrators who had learned their trade from mazarin colbert had removed abuses and reorganized finance with such success that louis found himself in sixteen sixty seven not merely free from debt 
but with an easily collected revenue of more than thirty-one millions of livres beyond what had been with difficulty wrung from the people at the death of mazarin lyonne had restored the navy which mazarin had permitted to rot away in sixteen sixty one the royal dockyards had contained eighteen weather-worn vessels scantily armed and manned in sixteen sixty seven france possessed a fleet of one hundred and ten well-built and amply equipped ships carrying three thousand seven hundred and thirty guns and manned by twenty one thousand nine hundred and fifteen men exclusive of officers the army was superb no fewer than one hundred and fifty thousand men officered by the veterans of the fronde were in constant drill field practice and garrison duty the utmost attention was given by the war minister louvois to raising the infantry hitherto the weakest arm to the standard of the unequalled cavalry and every inducement had been offered the noblesse to join its ranks in the provinces near the spanish low countries louis had amassed fifty thousand of his best troops while the whole country was covered with camps and arsenals the best means he says himself i thought of doing something of importance was to surprise my enemies by my diligence and by entering their country in arms before they could be ready to resist me i therefore got everything ready much sooner than was customary i collected everywhere corn meal fodder powder bullets guns and everything the lack of which might have delayed the march of my army but particularly i kept carefully exercising the troops immediately about my person in order that from my example the other leaders might learn to take the same care of those of whom they had the command a strong contrast to this energy was afforded by his enemies in spite of urgent warnings from the governors of the spanish low countries and franche comte the court of madrid sunk in lethargy made no preparations at the moment when the troops selected to accompany louis on his march were passing before him in review the spanish ministers were congratulating themselves on his deceptive assurances of peace a few days later their eyes were opened by receiving from him in a lengthy volume entitled the livre des droits a statement of his immediate claim on the spanish low countries and the suggestion of the future claim to the whole monarchy its arguments which were answered by lisola austrian ambassador at london and the hague in le bouclier d'etat et de justice were thus summed up france claims the spanish low countries by the right of marriage spain owns them in right of blood the provinces themselves owe allegiance in virtue of their customs the queen of france is wife of the first sister of the second and sovereign of the third a few days later louis forwarded this statement to the various courts of europe he presented his enterprise not as a war war indeed was not declared but as a mere entering into possession of his wife's inheritance he was going he said to travel in the spanish low countries there was no further delay on may twenty fourth sixteen sixty seven louis and turenne crossed the frontier castel rodrigo with a total force of twenty thousand men scattered in garrisons in towns whose fortifications were out of repair could make no resistance Beach was taken on the thirty first charleroi on june second by the eighteenth at tournay douay courtrai audenarde were in french hands in less than two months the whole south of the spanish low countries was at louis feet number three treaty of eventual partition of the spanish monarchy with leopold spain could not dream of effective resistance to louis her only hope was from outside she speedily found that from england nothing was to be expected though she was still ignorant of charles's secret engagement with louis taking advantage however of the revolution in portugal of november sixteen sixty seven which had overthrown don pedro and placed his brother alfonso on the throne and which had thus rendered the alliance with louis of no effect she made a peace with that country recognizing her at length as an independent kingdom she then turned to leopold 
the spanish low countries forming part of the circle of burgundy one of the ten circles into which for certain administrative and financial purposes the empire was divided was as such nominally under the protection of the empire and spain claimed a fulfilment of this duty but at the peace of westphalia the empire had agreed to give no assistance to spain during her war with france and in sixteen fifty eight leopold had renewed the engagement on his own account louis now took every step in his power to secure the continued fulfilment of these promises his ambassador at vienna de gramonville perhaps the ablest of his diplomatists had the charge of managing the emperor he so completely succeeded in his task that even when turenne had captured lille august twenty seventh sixteen sixty seven hitherto deemed impregnable and had routed the spanish force sent against him and when leopold in consternation had yielded to the pressure from madrid and ordered large levies of troops by taking the high hand he actually compelled the emperor to countermand his own orders not a man was enlisted and louis thus freed from anxiety was able at the end of september to put his army into winter quarters and return from his victorious progress to his capital with the diet of ratisbon louis was equally successful publicly he assured the princes that he would hold his conquests in the spanish low countries on the same terms relative to them and to the emperor as those upon which spain had held them privately he appealed to individual members by profuse bribery and he fomented the divisions which already existed among them in october sixteen sixty seven the diet resolved to confine its action to mediation and to let the claim to protection of the circle lapse in one respect only louis failed he was unable to secure another term of three years continuance of the rhine league with the two great protestant powers of the north brandenburg and sweden he dealt separately firm allies of france as their jealousy of the emperor had made them they began now to be alarmed rather at the prospect of an indefinite extension of french influence and their anxiety was increased by the endeavours of louis to secure the polish succession likely soon to become vacant by the abdication of john casimir for a prince of the french blood louis to whom poland was merely one of the counters with which he played the game at once changed his tone to secure the cooperation of brandenburg he not only withdrew his own claim but promised to support the election of the grand elector's relative the duke of neuburg won by this promise by a generous subsidy and by the engagement of louis to be moderate in his claims in the spanish low countries and persuaded by their ministers who down to the secretaries who wrote the draft had their pockets filled with french gold both the grand elector and the duke agreed to preserve a strict neutrality and to refuse a passage to the emperor's troops sweden was treated with less ceremony by the force of plain threats she also was induced to remain neutral the arrogant spirit of the french is shown by lyon's boast that in case france had any trouble from her she should be speedily sent back into her forests louis had thus taken all indirect precautions against leopold intervening in the struggle he now made use of arguments still more convincing without feint or reticence he laid before the emperor a project which by its straightforward appeal to his selfishness might induce him to break through those family and dynastic interests which at present prevented his cordial alliance with an enemy of spain this was no less than a scheme of the partition of the whole spanish monarchy between louis and himself should charles the second of spain die childless already in the beginning of sixteen sixty seven the idea had been mentioned tentatively and the negotiations were resumed with the utmost secrecy in october so well was that secrecy maintained that not until a few years ago was the existence of this intrigue and of the treaty which resulted from it known to the world between the first and second attempts louis had ascertained the conditions upon which the dutch would support him in coming to terms with spain they agreed that louis should hold franche comte cambrai and the cambrai 
Douay with the fort of Scarpe, Air, Saint Omer, Furn, and Berg with their dépendance or districts, and that Charleroi should be dismantled, or as an alternative that he should retain what he had already conquered. Louis now placed these conditions before Leopold, along with the enticing project of partition, by flattery of the emperor and his ministers, by first proposing exorbitant terms and then as great concessions withdrawing those which had no importance for France, by every device indeed known to diplomacy, even to downright lying, de Remonville at length brought about an agreement if spain should refuse to make peace with france on the suggested conditions the emperor would not help her provided louis did not push his conquests further in no case would france or austria attack each other in their own dominions the eventual division of the spanish monarchy was thus regulated the emperor was to have spain itself except navarre and rosas the west indies milan and the right of investiture to the duchy of siena and all the Spanish ports on the Sea of Tuscany up to the frontiers of Naples, while Louis was to take the Low Countries and Franche Comte, the eastern Philippines, Navarre and Rosas, all Spanish possessions in Africa, with Naples and Sicily, except as before arranged. Each power was to help the other to overcome resistance on the part of its new subjects. Local rights were to be disregarded. The agreement was not to lapse until any child that might be born to charles was six months old and the treaties of westphalia and the pyrenees were meanwhile to remain in full force End of section sixteen section seventeen of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter Thirteen: The Fall of Clarendon. While Louis the Fourteenth, absolute ruler of a great kingdom, was thus giving the law to Europe, Charles the Second of England was every day realizing more clearly how narrow were the limits of his own freedom. His Parliament had been showing itself imbued with precisely the same views as the Long Parliament of his father except that whereas that had been puritan this was anglican its enemies were the same popery military force and an uncontrolled use of the purse by the crown upon all three points the action of charles had excited bitter suspicion and discontent it was through that suspicion and discontent aided by many collateral causes and most of all by the base desertion of the king a desertion less notorious than his father's desertion of Stratford, only because the circumstances were less tragic and the personages less grandiose, that Clarendon was now struck down. The leading causes of his fall are easily discernible, though from the many purely personal questions which were involved it is impossible to give to each its just value in sixteen sixty two he had risked the king's favour by opposing the declaration of indulgence in sixteen sixty three his personal enemy the catholic earl of bristol made an ill-advised attempt to secure his impeachment for high treason but the charges were utterly frivolous charles gave no countenance to the proceeding bristol as the king prophesied only burnt his wings and clarendon remained the stronger for the attack he was however surrounded by enemies lady castlemaine the most vulgar and abandoned of the women who governed charles hated him with the hatred of disappointed vanity and avarice not only had clarendon steadfastly declined to court her favour he would not even permit his wife to visit her but he had frequently refused to pass grants for her from the king it was at her house that those nightly meetings were held at which a knot of young political adventurers to whose rise the all-absorbing power of the chancellor was an obstacle met to plan his overthrow ashley lauderdale william coventry and henry bennett better known as the earl of arlington whom clarendon had himself introduced to public life and who was now secretary of state in the place of nicholas had each his reasons for wishing his fall the disappointed cavaliers 
owed him a deep grudge for the indemnity bill in the bill of sales the catholics saw in him the representative of anglicanism the presbyterians and other dissenting sects laid their persecution at his door he was disliked by the courtiers for the reproach which the decency of his private life cast upon their excesses his daughter's marriage with the presumptive heir to the throne roused the jealousy of the nobility while the arrogance of his demeanour and his display of wealth alienated the citizens of london it was not least to his disadvantage that the gravity of his deportment lent itself to buckingham's ready wit and mimicry the bishops alone were his steadfast friends it was not until sixteen sixty six that grave political events placed him in direct antagonism to the parliament the incessant drain of money for the expenses at once of the dutch war and of the king's pleasures was gradually exasperating the commons they had with enthusiasm voted an enormous supply in sixteen sixty four and had followed this in sixteen sixty five with another of half the amount even then charles had been compelled to accept a proviso suggested by suspicion of waste that the money should be applied strictly to the war as in the parliament of charles i the doctrine had been established that taxation could not be raised without the consent of parliament so now was established the equally important doctrine that neither could it be spent without that consent clarendon's view of the constitution despite the lessons of the last twenty years was precisely the same as it had been when he served charles i the king was to work in combination with his parliament but he was not to allow the house of commons to force its will upon the house of lords still less was he to allow both houses combined to compel him to give the royal assent to bills of which his conscience disapproved he now incurred the displeasure of both the king and the commons by vehemently inveighing against this proviso as derogatory to the crown when however in september sixteen sixty six charles demanded yet another supply the country gentlemen upon whom the weight of taxation chiefly rested and who were scandalized at the excesses of the court in which they did not participate determined while offering a sum of one million eight hundred thousand pounds to frame further safeguards avoiding a direct attack upon the king they declared their belief that he had been cheated by the officials and demanded a public inspection of accounts they appointed a committee to examine all persons who could give information on the subject and they introduced a bill to nominate parliamentary commissioners to investigate expenditure and punish defaulters charles anxious only for the money did not oppose the action of the commons clarendon however again stood between them and their desires he declared that they had exceeded their proper functions and that this was a new encroachment as had no bottom an unconstitutional expansion of their privileges and that the scars were yet too fresh and green of those wounds which had been inflicted upon the kingdom from such usurpations he openly expressed his determination to oppose the bill to the utmost of his power when it came before the lords and he urged charles to refuse his sanction even if the lords permitted it to pass the further progress of the measure was stayed by a prorogation and before the next session clarendon had fallen the bill of the commons was then passed commissioners were appointed who were members of neither house and by their investigation shameful disorganization and peculation on a gigantic scale were brought to light but clarendon had taken a step which brought him still more directly into conflict with parliament he saw that the government and the commons were in constant antagonism he therefore pressed the king to have recourse to a dissolution the constitutional method of getting rid of such a difficulty his advice was not followed for charles felt that the present house contained a far greater number of his personal adherents and of the court officials than were ever likely to find seats again and the bishops represented the danger of the possible election of many presbyterians
the mere proposal however further increased the excitement against clarendon greater still was the jealousy caused in all classes by another suggestion perhaps the only one for which clarendon can be justly blamed how far charles was at the time endeavouring to realise his long-cherished desire of creating a standing army is doubtful it is however certain that on the pretence of guarding the coasts after the chatham disaster troops were now raised without any reference to parliament they were collected and equipped by some of the great nobility at their own cost but their maintenance had to be provided for and the exchequer was empty though parliament stood prorogued charles determined to summon it at once this resolve was opposed by clarendon on the formal ground that it was unconstitutional to summon a prorogued parliament before the day named for its meeting and to get over the difficulty he suggested that without waiting for parliamentary sanction royal letters should be sent to the lord lieutenants and deputy lieutenants of the counties in which the troops were raised authorizing them to call in provisions while the other counties should pay a proportionate subscription that he honestly believed this to be within the lines of the constitution is clear and nothing could more strongly prove how ignorant he was of the effect upon the english mind of cromwell's government by standing armies the effect was immediate at the meeting of parliament in july sixteen sixty seven the commons unanimously voted an address praying the king to disband the newly raised troops his reply was to rally them on their suspicion that he should dream of wishing for a standing army and once more for reasons which are very obscure to prorogue them this prorogation too was laid to clarendon's advice it became certain that whenever parliament should reassemble clarendon would be impeached among the bishops alone could he look for support charles himself while treating him with personal kindness displayed the cool ingratitude of his race to the man to whom he largely owed his peaceful and triumphant restoration he had indeed many causes of irritation against clarendon the chancellor had opposed his wish for toleration had not spared the most outspoken remonstrances upon the idle debauchery of his life and had thwarted him in at least one disgraceful intrigue he was tired of hearing on every side that so long as his minister was in power he was but half a king finally and this was with charles throughout his life the most potent argument it was easier in the presence of popular clamour to abandon than to support him just as in later years when consenting to the judicial murder of archbishop plunkett charles was not ashamed to exclaim i cannot save him because i dare not so now he was heard to say my own condition is such that i cannot dispute with them on august thirtieth sixteen sixty seven after a vain endeavour to induce clarendon to resign he sent him ill as he was at the time and mourning the death of his wife orders to deliver up the great seal he was rewarded by receiving the assurance of may lady castlemaine's secretary that he was now king which he had never been before personal dislike unscrupulous attack the virtues far more than the weaknesses of his private character the disasters of the nation the odium for which fell as always upon the most prominent figure in the kingdom and the ingratitude of charles had all much to do with clarendon's disgrace but the main cause is to be sought in the inherent weakness of his political theory he did not instinctively feel and therefore could not guide as pym had guided and shaftesbury was to some extent to guide the desires of his generation he was purely a constitutional lawyer with views of the constitution which he thought beyond argument or improvement his sole guide was the law as he understood it he had opposed laud and the star chamber because they were above the law and he had opposed parliaments when they acted against the law he endeavoured to secure a clause in an act of parliament to grant the king a dispensing power but he objected to the king's use of that power without parliamentary sanction as an illegal extension of the prerogative just as he objected to the claim for appropriation of supplies and the inspection of accounts 
as an illegal extension of parliamentary privilege these essentially negative views had not stood in the way had rather been advantageous at the restoration itself they had indeed then taken a positive aspect for clarendon's business was to restore the old parliamentary monarchy in strict connection with the old anglican church to come back to the broad lines of a constitution which he loved for such a task his firmness integrity knowledge of constitutional law and love of business fitted him beyond any man of his time but that task once finished the weakness of a position based upon negations showed itself he had neither the keenness to discern a coming change nor the elasticity of mind to adapt himself to it when it came had he been able to place himself at the head of the current popular opinion he might have died prime minister of england for his usefulness was incontestable as it was he stood in its way and was swept aside to make room for more supple men it is possible that charles had hoped that by his action he might save his old servant from further attack but he had misunderstood the temper of parliament everything that had gone wrong during clarendon's administration was laid to his initiative the sale of dunkirk the entering upon the dutch war the disaster at chatham the waste of public money when the commons met on october tenth sixteen sixty seven they had once voted an impeachment it was as extravagant as might have been expected of all the articles one only that in which he was accused of promoting a standing army the dissolution of parliament and the supporting troops upon forced contributions had even plausibility conscious of the weakness of their case they applied but in vain to the lords to commit clarendon on a general charge of treason clarendon hesitated long what course to pursue hearing however that charles had wondered why he did not withdraw himself he determined to take the hint which indeed soon became a positive command and on november twenty ninth he fled to france leaving parliament to the barren vengeance of passing an act banishing him for ever to which charles was forced to consent End of section seventeen